Okay, everyone. Hello. Happy Christmas. So, um, my job is to deliver the final Inspire lecture of the year, and we've kind of got a mixed format for you tonight. So, the plan is to do kind of three things. The first, to do a, a massive attempt at co-creation. So, my editor, Russell's up there at the top there, feverishly uh, writing everything down. What, what we're going to do is we're going to try and write an article featuring all of you uh, people in the room as co-authors for next week's final kind of edition of Marketing Week of the Year. And so what we're going to do is I'm going to show you the 10 things that happened this year that I think are the most important. And I'm going to give you the rating or ranking that I think what I would have done if I hadn't been here, frankly. I just have knocked it out as 1 to 10. But then we're going to give you a chance in these new friendship groups that Sherilyn has just introduced you to, to fuck around with the column and suggest new stuff and change the order. And I will, I promise, uh, we, will, we will alter it based on the feedback tonight. And it will appear, Russell, when will it appear? Uh, next week, or when you write it, I suppose. Thanks, Russell, very helpful. <laughs> Thank you. That's my editor there. He's a genius, as you can see. He's on top of everything. So next week, sometime, when I write it, apparently. It's online, right? So we'll, we'll, we'll credit you all somehow as being co-authors of the article, okay? So that's the sort of first bit is let me talk to you brief, not brief, half an hour about what I was going to write and go through the ten things. Then we'll have a little bit of audience participation where you can fuck around with the article and I'll write notes down. And then the last bit is we're just going to open it up to q and A. I'm, I'm petrified that if I don't have content, we won't have anything to talk about. It'll just be like an embarrassed silence for 20 minutes. But Sherilyn reassures me that there's loads of questions that we can talk indiscreetly about. So if you've got hot questions, we can definitely spend time talking about those. And then we hit the wine, OK? That's, that's the plan for the, for the session. So let, let's do the first bit first, because it's really the, the reason we're all here, is to try and do a review of what's been an extraordinary year, OK? So I'm going to do them in reverse order of importance, from 10 to 1. Uh, and these are genuinely what I think, having thought about it for far too long, are the 10 big moments in the right order as far as I'm concerned, but I'll defer to you, OK? So for each one, I'll just briefly remind you what the moment was. Uh, hopefully you remember most of them, but a couple of them might, might have passed you by. And then I'll try and talk about why I think it's important for marketers. This isn't a general league table of, of all important stuff tonight, right? This is specifically for us as marketers and what marked our, our big year of 2016. And I think as we go through it, you'll start to realize how big a year it was. And then the co-creation bit is to say, you can fuck around with it. Start to think as we go through this, oh, he's missed this one. You know, he should have that one in there. Or the one he's talking about is totally meaningless. That's bullshit. You don't have that one in there. And also, if any of them you feel are more or less important to you as a marketer. Okay, because that's what I'm going to get you to discuss, and then we're going to do that at the end. All right, does that make sense? So you can keep notes, keep mental notes. Okay? So let's start with number 10, which I think is in there, but is the least important of the 10, okay? Which is Brexit. Now, I know Brexit's super fucking important for, for Britain and the European Union and people in general, okay? But from a marketing point of view, I, I think it's there, but not that important, yeah? I think it's important because it's going to change prices, and we've already seen that happening with Tesco and so on. But there's a bigger lesson for, for marketers from Brexit, and that's the reason I've put it in. And it's a lesson related to how we see the world. So if we go back to, uh, to the summer, that dreadful summer, where, I mean, some of you might be in favour of Brexit, I don't know, I don't know how, you, how you voted, who knows, but... I pretty much do know how you vote for reasons I'll show you in a minute. So the, the shock of Brexit was, was astonishing. If you remember, it was greeted that day as the sort of results rolled out, and then the next morning there was that weird kind of vibe. And, and generally, everyone was just amazed about what had happened. And it sort of started to become a myth within Britain that the statistics had all predicted that it just wasn't going to be a Brexit vote. We were going we to vote to remain. And it started this this trope about um, post-truth. And as you probably know, the Oxford English Dictionary has picked post-truth as the word of the year. And it will come in and out of this presentation as well. But Brexit was seen as the evidence why post-truth was upon us, right? Because the data said we weren't going to leave and then we left. And it turns out that's not how it happened at all. And even though it was only six months ago, it really isn't an accurate summary. And, and in fact, it was kind of like a coin toss. If you look at the very last poll of polls that were taken just before Brexit, the actual Brexit vote, this is what they looked like. And so 
it's not really as unlikely as we might have thought that the Leave vote would have won. In fact, it's almost, almost 50-50. It's probably within the margin of error of these two votes. So somehow we convinced ourselves in the marketing community that this Brexit thing was completely from left field and shouldn't have happened, when in reality it, it was a pretty much a straight shot. So why were we so shocked? Something that was pretty much 50-50 happened. And I think to understand that, you have to understand what modern marketers look like. And they look like this. If you take the average marketer, she's 28. She's female, not male. She has a degree in something. Um, her average salary is about 28,000 quid. She lives in metro areas. She usually votes Labour. She believes in immigration. She actually sees it as a positive for the country. And she's hopeful about the future. Right? You should recognise that person because she's you. Even the blokes in the room. She's you. Okay? <laughs> This is the, and we recognize this woman from our offices, do we not, in our marketing role. So this is her. Now the reason that's interesting is if you contrast her with all of the research that was done later to slice and dice why people voted for Brexit and who voted for Brexit. So who among that 52% uh, went for Brexit and why? What emerges is a very clear picture. And the Brexiters are a very different bunch. Their average age is 54. They're much more likely to skew male. They finish their education as high schoolers. They're on a £19,000 average salary. They live more in rural and semi-metro areas. They're more likely to vote conservative. They're dead against immigration, and they're very worried about the future. Now, it's easy to see, look at these people, and it was done at the time, if you remember, and argue that they're sort of not bright or somehow missing something. And that's not fair, right? They're just as bright as marketers. But the point is they're different, yeah? They're different. So why were we so shocked? We were so shocked about Brexit because we hang out with her, right? We are her, and we don't get to meet him very often. And the reality is, this is the market, just as much as this is, but we weren't looking at that data. We were just looking at the people closest to us. And I think this illustrates, not Brexit itself, but the shock of Brexit afterwards, illustrates the key challenge of marketing that we are failing badly, and I think next year we'll fail even worse, which is the first lesson of marketing, which is market orientation. And I, 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 I despair a little bit of MBA programs, if I'm honest with you, because you've got all these people without any background in marketing teaching marketing at business school now, right? And they're all fundamentally nice, but Muppet-like people, yeah? Because <laughs> they don't know the discipline they're teaching, frankly, right? And so one of the things you see in that is they don't start the MBA course in marketing with market orientation. They start it with market research. And that's fundamentally stupid. Because no matter how much research you've got, if you're not market oriented, you won't pay any attention to it. And you've all, you all know these managers and clients and marketers that have stacks of market research on their desk but don't pay attention to it. Or sit in the back of the focus group going, nah, I'm not sure this is right. They're the people that have, have the data but don't have the market orientation. So market orientation is very simple. It means you know absolutely fucking nothing as a marketer. That's it. You have not a clue about your product or service. You know nothing. In fact, it's worse than that because you're not the consumer. You're literally the opposite of the consumer. You're the least qualified person in the world to know about your product. Literally, right? My dad, who's an idiot, he knows more about the product than you do, right? Literally. And so the way I explain this is, it's, it's weird, right? But I'm producing this talk, right, for the next 50 minutes, right? So here's how this works. Because I'm producing this talk, I can't work out if it's any fucking good or not. And the reason I can't work out if it's any fucking good or not is because I'm, I'm doing it, see? I'm producing it up there, so I can't get into your head to say, what the fuck is this guy talking about? Or this is changing my life. I have no idea, right? And, and that applies to you. If you're a producer, you cannot be a consumer. You're disqualified. And every time you look at the website, or the packaging, or the price, or your retail strategy, all you're seeing is a bunch of horseshit because you're making it, right? That's the start of marketing, market orientation. You don't know anything. And, and the way we train it into people is, it's like a vacuum. If you're a really well-trained, disciplined marketer, 
and someone says to you, what do you think about this product that you're working on? You go, I don't know. There's almost a blackness in the middle of your head. Do you know what I mean? And that blackness is, I don't know. And it leads to market research. But without it, you can have all the market research in the world, but you don't pay attention to it. And I think Brexit is a classic test of marketers. Because I think we weren't market oriented. I think we talked to six or seven other young 28 year old women over a cappuccino somewhere near Oxford Street and went, well, everyone's fucking in favor of staying. It's not going to happen, is it, right? And we missed the point, which is we're not the consumer. Yeah? And we're completely skewed. And this is the softest of them all points, the market orientation point, but it's for me the most important. Yeah? It's the philosophy of marketing. You don't know who your competition is, you don't know if your price is too high. You don't know anything. And I think if we'd have all been market-oriented during the, the period that became known as Brexit, it wouldn't have shocked us at all because we'd have looked at the bloody data. There are very few people who predicted Brexit. Actually, I happen to be one of them, but there are very few who actually spotted it, right? And I think that's because we weren't looking at the data. We were looking at the people around us. Let me give you another example which is close to my heart. So this is a great bit of data which was collected by uh, Ipsos for Thinkbox, which is the wonderful group that does all that research on TV. And it was collected in October this year from the UK. It's very recent data. What it is, is it's, it's from a representative sample, in this case, of people who work in advertising agencies in the UK. And it's asking them which social platforms they are members of. And you see what I think probably fits pretty much close to you, right? LinkedIn, YouTube, you see the penetrations of these things, yeah? Now, what's interesting is the TV Nation guys don't just do a representative sample of advertisers. They do a representative sample of the British public as well. So they can look at advertisers and what I like to call normal people. Yes? <laughs> this is what the normal people look like compared to the advertising people. And we're back to market orientation, see? Because if we are market oriented, we wouldn't think the world was so digital because we'd look at the right-hand side of that data and realize most people aren't that digital at all. Certainly not as digital as me and my marketing friends. But we don't do that because we're not market-oriented. We go, well, myself and Julie, we're, you know, we're on LinkedIn all the time. Everyone definitely is as a result. So this is a classic test, right? If you were market-oriented, don't get me wrong, it doesn't, you, can, you don't need to be off LinkedIn to understand people who are off it. But you have to know that they're different from you. But that's not how it works. This skews everything. So one of the other things TV Nation does is they then ask the advertisers to guess what the data might be for normal people to see how far their perceptions are off. Here's just two of the data points. So one of the things they ask advertisers to guess is, how long does the average viewer spend each day watching YouTube? Yeah? What's roughly, anyone care to hazard a guess? How long is the average time? Sir? 17 minutes. So you know the fucking answer. Yeah, you could say that. Very good, very good. The average marketer, unlike the handsome, uh, talented, bearded gentleman over there, the average marketer in the, in the survey said an hour and two minutes a day. Uh, that was their answer. And the actual answer is 16 minutes. You're off. Actually, you're wrong. Totally wrong. 16 minutes, okay? This is, this is dangerous, is it not? Yes? This is dangerous. Because clearly what's happening is my life as a marketer is influencing my guesses. Other guesses, uh, let me give you one more example, there's tons more. How much time does the average viewer spend, what proportion of their TV watching time is spent second screening as well as watching the TV? Anyone care to have a guess? What? Madam? Half and half? 50? Hour and a half. What proportion though of your TV time though, let's say? 80%. The average marketer, the average marketer, I like you better. The average marketer <laughs> thought it was 50%, and the actual answer is 19%. We are not the market. We are a highly unrepresentative group, and that doesn't matter as long as we have that inbuilt vacuum in our heads of market orientation. But we don't, and increasingly we don't. And this post truth world has many victims, but marketers, I think, will be the most uh, painful ones. So, I think I, I'm going to put Brexit in. My, my argument to you tonight is I want it number 10, and more the shock of Brexit than what Brexit actually means. It's a huge societal thing, but for marketers, I'd only have it at number 10. Number 9, Unilever's budgeting. It's got to go in there. It's got to go in there somewhere. And I think it's, it should go in about number 9. So, 
You may or may not follow this. It's back in January when this happened, okay? So Paul Pullman announced, uh, middle of January, that Unilever was going to move to a zero-based approach to marketing, okay? And one of the things I love about marketers is they're sort of sweet, you know what I mean? When they don't know what the fuck something means, they just look at how, it, how it's described and, and make a, a formulate an immediate opinion about something. So if you said to me, you know, marketers, do you, do you fancy doing a bit of zero base? Ooh, no, that doesn't sound very good. It's got zero in it, it's all base. Ooh, no, no, no. I'd rather do blue sky thinking. We've got blue and there's a sky, you know? Zero, zero base, that doesn't sound good. So there was a general sort of feeling of, oh, this, this must be bad, right? And we had uh, Unilever were just following, Kraft Heinz had already announced it, and before them, Coca-Cola. So most of the big consumer goods companies, actually by now almost all of them, have moved to a zero-based approach. And when companies this big, with this much marketing heft, change their whole system, it tells you two things. One, they will have an enormous influence in and of itself, but also these companies lead everyone else. There are very few things, if you look back over the last 20 years, that Unilever has done that we haven't all ultimately followed, starting with corporate social responsibility and everything else. They're ahead of the curve, right? So I think it tells you that zero base is coming. Now, to understand zero base, because it is a, a peculiarly complex topic, even though it's not that hard, what we have to do is understand how you currently set your marketing budget, which is what financial people call total fucking horseshit, okay? <laughs> Let's talk about how 95% of you in this room get your budget for next year, right? Not the actual financial amount, but the manner in which the method, using the word method very loosely, the method in which they calculate how much money you have to spend next year, all right? And all this is true. I'm not overstating it or simplifying it. This really is how crap it is. You ready? A woman, and it's never a woman, it's always a man, but I want to be politically correct, so I'm going to show you a woman, okay? A woman in Zoog, okay? The CFO. In Zoog or Cincinnati, occasionally London, but mostly Zoog these days in Switzerland, sits at a desk and works out your budget. So, she looks at your 2016 projected sales for the year. Let's assume you work on a calendar year, just for simplicity's sake, okay? So she looks at your 2016 calendar year sales, which by now is projected to be, let's say, 10 million quid, okay? Then she looks back on the last four or five years of sales that you've done and applies a very simple CAGA, yeah? Compound annual growth rate. So she kind of averages out the performance over the last three or four years, looks for the trend, and applies whatever that trend is, let's say it's 10%. So you're growing by 10%, the market's good, blah, blah, blah. Then, by applying, stay with me, this is hard, by applying the CAGA to the past year performance, she comes up with your expected 2017 revenue figure, which is, hey presto, 11 million pounds. With me? Then, she applies an advertising to sales ratio or AS ratio, yeah? Which is the proportion of these sales that you will be given, not just for advertising, but overall for marketing, okay? Now let's say it's 5%, which is not unusual, it will be low for many of you, but let's say it's a 5% advertising to sales ratio. By applying the 5% to the 11 million, hey presto, your marketing budget is set for the year, okay? Everyone with me so far? And that's pretty much how it's done, right? Let us now explore how completely fucking mental this is, right? Even though it's how all of you are gonna get your budget shortly. You ready? Why the fuck would a CFO who's never been to the UK, never seen any market research, never worked in marketing, why is she in charge of your marketing budget, right? She works in finance, she's Swiss or Dutch or something else, and she has no inclination whatsoever for the potential of your product or market. That should trouble you right away. Next. If she already fucking knows how much money she's going to make next year, what's the point of doing any marketing? <laughs> if I explain this to a 15-year-old, they'd go, that doesn't make any fucking sense, Dad. And you'd go, yeah, it doesn't, right? 95%, right? She's already booked the revenue figure for next year. So at this point, all strategy dies, right? That's the key point. If you've got a relatively good strategic brain, you go, it's all fucking bullshit, yeah? They already know. Sandbag, sandbag, sandbag. See what I mean? 
The strategic moment is dead before the year begins. And where does the 5% come from? Why isn't it 6 or 12 or 19.6%? I mean, the 5% does come from a special place, right? The CFOs use a certain database. You've heard of the SOMA database, right? That's where they get these figures from. All CFOs use it. SOMA, the straight out of my ass database. No, it's true. It's there. It's right there. That's where it comes from. I don't know why you're laughing. It's your budget. It's your life you're laughing at here, by the way, right? These arbitrary percentages, right? That is how almost all of you in the room get your marketing budget. And I'm not exaggerating. The, 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 good old, the late great Simon Broadbent used to do studies to work out how much, but it's definitely more than 90% of companies in this room. It's non-strategic nonsense. Yeah? Zero base is the fix for this, which is why Unilever and Kraft Heinz and Coke are doing it. Right? It doesn't mean we're going to spend less, necessarily. There are many companies that do genuinely end up investing more. Okay? But it means we have to apply more logic than this nonsensical approach that currently dominates the way of marketing setting. So the first point to say as a marketer is, I know we like things that don't have zeros in them, but this is actually a good zero, okay? Don't fear the zero. There are two reasons why the zero is good. We're going to start next year's marketing budget with the assumption of no spend at all, okay? I.e., we're going to treat next year like it's different from this year. And we're not going to carry over any kind of money from the previous year, because each year is different. Competitors have changed and so on. So the zero means we start from zero, and the crucial one, we are not going to pre-allocate any money. And this is particularly important. The minute you have a digital marketing budget, you're a Muppet. Yeah? You don't get it. The minute you do that, even though 40% of you are doing it, the minute you have a digital budget, you're an idiot. Yeah? Because you've just done something completely wrong. You've put tactics ahead of strategy. Now, let me make it very clear, because oh, everyone gets me wrong on this. I work for lots of companies, several companies that are 100% digital in their communication spend. Let's start with Sephora, right? Benefit, right? Both of them, to my knowledge, next year will go in with 100% digital spend. That's perfect for them. But neither of those companies started with some stupid half-assed digital marketing budget. They started with nothing. They did a plan and they worked out the best way to invest their money was in the various digital tools versus other alternative tools. That's super groovy. But the minute you, you skip over strategy and just allocate 20 or 30 or 40% of your money to digital, it's over, man. You've, you've just made a stupid error. Now, that's very hard to do if, you, if your card says digital marketing, but that's what's happening right now. So the joy of zero base is we start each year fresh in terms of total and allocations. And again, that's why the big boys are interested in it right now. So imagine, you do your research each year, right? You actually do the research. You do your STP, your segment, your target, your position. You build a decent purchase funnel, okay? Which gives us the main steps along the journey for the market. And you come up with some smart objectives. Let's pause here, right? You can't write objectives that are what A.G. Laffley, the old boss of P&G, used to call dreams that will never come true. If you ever want to spot the difference between a good and a bad marketer, Ask them for their objectives. The shit one has like eight objectives, right? That's probably seven too many. And second, they're all written like waspy imaginations of happiness, you know? Improve brand love among millennials, right? The fuck is that, right? Like, ooh, right? Objectives are hard, pointy things, right? Hard, pointy things that we cannot escape. They have a benchmark, they have a goal, they have a target segment, they have a date by which they will be achieved, and they have a moment of truth, the come to Jesus moment, where you either get promoted or you lose your bonus because you did or didn't achieve the goal, right? And there's usually one or two of them at a good company, right? Not 15 of them spread out across a four-page plan. That's the difference. You need smart objectives here because we're going to turn these into money. If you achieve the objective, we're going to work out in a minute what it's worth, okay? So you cal calculate the advantage of increasing consideration or driving awareness from X to Y, which isn't that difficult if you've got a purchase funnel. You annualize the value because it won't happen on January the 1st. You brief your agencies. Again, here's a key point. You don't do what the agencies do. 
If you talk to people right now in London, I had a very interesting conversation last night. Uh, two, two pints inside someone who works in an ad agency is like a truth machine, right? <laughs> Everything's great. Two pints of even cheap beer, and it's off, right? No client at the moment has a strategy, right? What the clients have right now is some tactical wishes and over-briefing. What they're missing is all of this. And it's getting worse. It's getting to the point of great concern. Clients aren't able to brief agencies anymore because they don't actually have any strategy. They've just got a bunch of tactical ideas that they want to execute. And the agencies are kind of embarrassed for them but can't say anything. Yeah? You brief agencies on your strategy. Agencies are totally shit at strategy. They think they're awesome, but they're shit at it. Yeah? And you are shit at tactics. Yeah? Your creative ideas suck ass. Right? So do mine. It's okay. We're marketers, not creative people. Yeah? You might be more creative than the guy that works next to you. That's because he's an idiot. Right? When you truly work for good creative teams in decent agencies, you go, holy shit, what's that? That's proper professional creative people. Learn to brief. Don't over-brief. The minute you start sketching ideas out about what the new ad should look like, you fucked it, right? Strategy, and then let professional creative people answer the brief properly, yeah? So again, an another good advantage is zero base. Then, you debrief your agencies on what they think they can do and so on, and then you make a proper marketing plan and you present it to senior management. And I've seen these presentations and they are awesome. Because they end with two things. Give me X amount of money, and if you believe in my plan, I will give you back Y amount of money at the end of the year. Almost as if, almost as if, marketing was an investment in the business. Rather than a total fucking waste of time, because we've already worked out how much money we're going to make next year. Now, there is an implication here some of you will have smelled. Yeah? If this is the path you go down, <laughs> and I've been down it with several companies, the great news is you might ask for more money than we were expecting, and we might give it to you if your plan's good. But when Christmas comes next year, you better have the fucking money, yeah? Because it's a proper plan now. You have proper responsibilities. But my goodness, this is the way it was meant to be, yeah? And the other little implication of Zero Base, which happens about year two, is you're competing not just with other brands, but with the other brand managers in your company. Because when the MD sits down and she sees, you know, knobhead number one with a ridiculous plan that doesn't make any sense, and then you turn up, but you want twice the money, she goes, I'm taking knobhead's money and I'm going to give it to her, right? It's option theory, and so it should be, and so it should be. Let's give the money to the fit, to the smart, to the ones with potential. So this is the kind of game we play. The zero is good, and I think the fact that Unilever have gone there means that it is coming to a, a boardroom near you soon, Yeah? And it's an important step, I think, in improving the way marketers operate. All right, number eight. Oh, fuck me. The Marriott-Starwood merger. I don't know if this passed you by. Are you ready? This is a massive one um, for marketing. So, uh, Starwood, dead interesting, put themselves on the market. Uh, basically, and I'm paraphrasing because they don't fancy it anymore, right? Airbnb has had a massive Im impact on, on the businesses of, of hotel already. And, and pretty much Starwood said, oh, look, fuck looks a bit tasty for us, who wants to buy us, right? And the answer was the Marriott Group bought them for 10 billion pounds. So that's created a gigantic hotel group. One in 15 hotel rooms on the planet is now part of this group, to give you some sense of the scale of this thing. And the CEO of, uh, of Marriott, um, when, he, when the deal went through, he was delighted. He said, well, we've got an ability to offer not just that much more choice, a choice in locations, a choice in the kind of hotel, a choice in the amount a customer needs to spend. And he's right, he's got choice. In fact, he's got far too much choice. So, here's your portfolio. Imagine being the CMO at the newly created Marriott Starwood Group. You ready? Here's your brands, okay? JW Marriott, Ritz Carlton, Gaylord, Bulgari, Edition, Autograph, Marriott, uh, Protea, never heard of that one, Residence Inn, Courtyard, Fairfield Suites, right? That's just Marriott. Then you've got Sheraton, Four Points, the Meridian, Western, the Luxury Collection, St. Regis, W, Starwood, Loft, right? It is the mother of all brand architecture challenges. And, and remember the key lesson of the last 10 years. More brands is worse than having less brands. So they're going to have to kill a shed load of brands here. And each one of these things has probably got 
close to a billion dollars of brand equity. Now, this is their first effort after, what, three months. Uh, those of you who are, who are more attuned to this will notice they haven't actually done anything, right? <laughs> all they've done, all they've done is they've put it together and then they've created classic and distinctive, right? And that's kind of it. So that's what's called not doing anything yet, right? Somewhere, somewhere deep in the Western headquarters, I hope they're looking at segmentation data, but if this is the final move, there's trouble ahead. It won't be. They're, I'm sure they're up to it, right? This is a very famous sheep, uh, at least in Australia, right? This is Shrek the sheep, yeah? And Shrek was a, a very famous sheep because she managed to avoid the, 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 the sheepdogs for about three years, and she was hiding in a cave, and therefore, obviously, as you can see, avoided being sheared for three years. Uh, and finally, because literally she couldn't fucking see anything and her legs didn't work, they, they did finally catch her and they rolled her on to the farmyard and sheared her. And there's a happy ending because here she is, look, loving, loving life. Well, at least she can fucking see now, right? Um, loving life uh, as a sheared sheep. But my point about, about the sheep is this, look. That, that's, that's Marriott Group, that is. See what I mean? <laughs> and it's probably you as well, if you haven't killed brands recently. When I teach brand architecture, I spend about an hour on like, brand extension and three days on brand killing. It, 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 you know, it, no one needs more brands anymore or diversification. We definitely need less. And, and the, the point is, the sheep keeps growing wool, right? Shrek kept growing wool. So if you work for a company, or you, right now you work for a company that has too many brands, there isn't a moment where someone comes in the office and goes, oh, look, we've got to stop now. We've got like fucking more brands than P&G, right? We've got to stop now. That's not what happens at all here. It speeds up, right? HR starts inventing fucking brands, right? And the sales force create a new brand for their training program. Before you know it, you have like nine, it's a logarithmic number of brands, right? The sheep keeps growing more. And like the sheep, more brands naturally growing through acquisition and diversification, eventually they make the sheep impractical, okay? So let's, let's continue the animal metaphor. This is my favorite animal, right? The most successful mammal on the planet, yeah? This is Rattus norvegicus, otherwise known as the brown rat. And although it's called Rattus norvegicus, like anything successful and quite vicious, it comes from China originally, okay? <laughs> Rattus norvegicus is, has colonized every country on the planet, okay? including in the UK. Right now, the statistic is almost certainly true, you are less than five meters away from a brown rat, right? It will be, it, trust me, there'll be one down there somewhere, right? Scuttling around in your, in, your, in your stockings. So, why is the brown rat so successful? Why has it managed to colonize pretty much every place on the planet? And the reason is it practices something quite horrific. The brown rat practices infanticide. The brown rat eats its own babies. So there's a great article in Nature a few years about, about the brown rat. So on average, she has four litters a year, the damn rat, and she will average six pups per litter. But when the mother rat gets cold or stressed or hungry, she will pick out the weakest runt in the litter and she will kill and eat it. And on average, she will often consume half of her litter. So I've got a video, it's not easy to watch, but it shows, I think, this process. No, no, I'm only fucking with it. I haven't really got <laughs> I wish I had a video. I have looked for a video. There's two things I learned putting this presentation together. Don't look for videos on Google on rat killing. It's not good. Also, and this is a true story, don't look for pictures or images of large male ass, which is what I looked for for that earlier graphic. <laughs> That's something that will take me months to forget, right? <laughs> it was only three seconds on Google image search. It's not going away right now, right? <laughs> what the fuck are we talking about here? The point of the brown rat is, this is horrendous, right? But the point of the brown rat is super important for you and super important for the Marriott group. Why does the brown rat kill its babies? There are only two precepts that operate when the brown rat thinks about stuff. The first is the mother rat must survive to breed again. And the second precept is, as many of the pups must live to breed as adults as well. Now, what is the point of this grotesque story? Turn the mother rat into your company and turn the pups into your brands or products. 
and you instantly see the logic of brand killing and, and the gigantic stage and challenge that Westin now face and that Marriott now face. Too many brands suckling on the corporate teat kills everything, everything. It's not that Marriott will have a few less successful brands. It's that the whole organization will be weak versus competitors because they have too many brands. You must learn to kill. Any moron can create a new spanky brand with a lovely logo and do a massive disservice to the company. Only the skilled, A, don't do that, and B, learn to kill. And learn to kill a brand, but keep the customer. That's the real skill in all this. Too many of you in this room are Buddhists when it comes to marketing. You think all life is beautiful, brands must be protected, all brands deserve life. It's the wrong fucking God for the decade we live in, right? More of you should worship Shiva, or rather Shiva's wife, the goddess of death. Death is good. Killing is good. Get the fucking knife out and slice away at the brand portfolio. One of my big heroes is Alan Mulally, and Mulally is your perfect exemplar for this, and we'll teach uh, Marriott a lot. So when Mulally arrived in 2006 at Ford as the new CEO, he had this amazing portfolio of brands. And he had this lovely morning trying out all the cars, and he went upstairs and he discovered that he had to announce the following Monday that Ford was about to lose $17 billion for the financial year, right? And as he says, you don't get to make that announcement very often before there are no more announcements, right? What he does next makes him special. He gets rid of Jaguar and Landra, sells them off to Tata Motors. Gets rid of Aston Martin, selling it to private equity. Shuts down Volvo and Mercury, leaving him really with only one brand. Why does a man that is losing billions of dollars get rid of five-sixths of his brands for peanuts? And the answer is, so he can make money. In his final year as CEO, after a string of record performances, Mulally announced a $17 billion profit for the year with one brand rather than six. Now, here's the key point. If you believe in sales as the measure of success, Mulally is a massive failure. 2006 was a record year for sales, for revenue for the Ford company. But who fucking cares? They lost $17 billion. If you follow the signpost mark sales, it's always pointing to the opposite direction to brand, or almost always. But look for the profit signpost. It's normally pointing in about the same direction as brand. You'll be surprised. You must kill because profits, not sales, drive the company. And if you look back at this Marriott story from this year, the reason it's so important is it'll either make the strongest hotel company in the world, or it could quite conceivably break them. And here's the worst challenge of all, and we'll move on to our next one. If the people at Marriott aren't very good, you know what they're going to do? They're going to look at the shit little brands, and they're going to go, well, we can kill Fairfield, that shit, and we'll kill that one, and we'll kill that one. And they'll kill a few. That's not the question for you or for Marriott. Start with one brand, just one, Marriott. Now give me a very fucking good reason why you need to. And if you can't find it, get rid of them. That's an entirely different mindset. They've got 30 brands. If they kill weak, they'll end up with 24, and they'll still have too many. They'll start with one, and they might get to six or seven, but that's the way to do it. And we'll see next year how well they progress. All right, number seven, easier one. The McDonald's Omnicom deal. Some of you will remember this if you work in agencies. So the deal. McDonald's wanted to consolidate all of their advertising business, they're a massive client. This is just in America. They spend almost a billion dollars a year on advertising just in America, and this is just for their American business. Omnicom, and DDB was the lead agency, which is part of Omnicom, but Omnicom basically won the business, which is a huge deal, right? And they won it by creating a specialized agency called We Are Unlimited. It's a wanky name, but what it means is they've created a special new agency that only works for Maccas in Chicago. Now, interestingly, this new agency they've just announced will have 120 staff drawn from the Omnicom various agencies, both media agencies, creative and digital. And approximately 80 will be from outside companies, most notably Twitter, Facebook, and Google, to form the final team. But this is the best bit of all. There will be no profit at the new agency. Everything they're going to do will be done at cost, including media buying. Okay? The only way that We Are Unlimited can make any money 
is if they achieve the objectives agreed at the start of each year by McDonald's. And these will be business objectives related to traffic, sales, etc. So everything they're going to do is zero margin, and then there's an agreement each year on how much they'll get paid. It's 100% performance-based pay. So why is this in the list? Because it's scary motherfucker stuff if you work in an agency, right? If you work on a client, it's very exciting. And it's funny, when this came out, the reaction of agencies was, oh my god, this is the apocalypse. And the reaction of clients was, that sounds like a pretty good idea. <laughs> so the two big ones are it's zero margin, right? It's zero margin. So 50% of deals in the UK are estimated now to be partly performance-based. But we're talking about complete performance-based pay. And I think this will grow dramatically as the metrics crisis that is bound to kick off over the next five years really takes hold. I don't think anyone knows what CPM is anymore. They know what the C is. The M's complete horseshit. It was always a bit horseshit. Now it's total horseshit. So they're going to move to whatever the CPM was, did it have the impact on the traffic that you promised me? And second, and we'll come back to this one later, it begins the story, the biggest story in marketing of the century. It tells you again an example of how the digital duopoly will begin to insert themselves into pretty much everything. Yes, they have walled gardens, which means they either are going to work directly with clients who don't need agencies anymore, pretty much, or, as you see in this deal, they'll be part of the agency teams, in but also out. Yeah? That's interesting. Omnicom's a very big group with a lot of different companies, but almost half of the employees are coming from these third-party companies. All right, number six. P&G pulls out of Facebook, right? And it's in inverted commas because they didn't pull out of Facebook. They'll spend more on Facebook next year than they did this year. So that's not fair on Facebook, right? Um, P&G didn't pull out of Facebook. What they did was completely change the way they did targeting. So here's Mark Pritchard, who's the CMO of P&G, very smart man. Here's how he explained to the Wall Street Journal what they were doing. We targeted too much, and we went too narrow. And now we're looking at what is the best way to get the most reach but also the right precision. So what P&G were doing, in this case with Febreze, was they were doing Facebook-style targeting. And you know how this works as well as I do, right? Micro-granular targeting. We can get someone that owns a house, has a pet, is pissed off with their husband, showers twice a day. We can buy that person so they see five Febreze ads a day. We can do that, literally, right? What Pritchard said this year was, it's not worth it. And even though we can do it, it's not giving us as good a return. And actually, we're better off targeting a broader group that we get better reach for, less precise, because we'll get, we believe, a better return in the long run. Just because we can do micro-targeting with Facebook doesn't mean that we're going to do it. Now, don't make a mistake here that most of the journals did. They're still advertising with Facebook. They're just going to use demographics uh, and a little bit of behavioral data rather than the full suite of targeting metrics. Now, why is that? Byron Sharp. Byron Sharp. Byron Sharp. <laughs> Byron Sharp has his dirty mitts all over P&G as well, right? Now, let's, let's give Professor Sharp his credit, and then we'll have a crack at him, okay? <laughs> Byron Sharp is the most powerful marketing thinker in the world. No question. Gary Vanderchuk, close second, but that's a different story, okay? Byron Sharp has changed the world of marketing like no one else has, and he deserves a ton of credit, okay? And he has took us back to a more realistic place as well. Every CMO in the world has Byron's book in their briefcase. Literally. Literally. I promise you that, right? It, it, it's a book you cannot afford not to read. Because it's the first meaningful book in 30 years in marketing that says something different, okay? Now, some of it is wrong, okay? Some of it is, is stretched way out of, of context. And Byron won't accept any of that because it's a, it's a scientific thing, right? Let's not get there. The point is, one of the things that Byron is keen on, and I think mostly wrong about, but not always, is targeting, right? So he calls what he does sophisticated mass marketing. That's mass marketing with a cravat and a pipe. Sophisticated mass marketing doesn't mean targeting everyone, nor does it mean treating everyone the same. It means understanding the heterogeneity in your market and then catering for only the differences that matter in order to maximize reach while not eliminating the benefits of scale. Now you can see a direct link between these guys, because I don't know this for sure, but I'm pretty sure that's Byron helping P&G. 
and pulling them back from micro-targeting. Evidence B would be Mars. So Bruce McCall just retired as the CMO of Mars. He's definitely getting this from Byron because now he's going to go and work with Byron. This is what Bruce said at the start of the year. I'm not a great believer in targeting. Our target is about 7 billion people sitting on the planet. Our task is to reach as many people as we can to get them to notice us, remember us, to nudge them, and hopefully get them to buy us once more this year. This is the face of modern targeting. Make no mistake. And so this idea of mass marketing, which has been out of fashion for a century, is back in. Just to be clear, this is what's happened in the last 12 months. So in the beginning, we had you know, cliched mass marketing. Henry Ford, any colors on it's black. I'm part of a very old school, right? Which I thought was kind of the only school which was targeting, right? So we came along and said, when you segment, target, and then position, you have a much greater attraction with customers, you build, and it works. I mean, it worked throughout my consulting career. And when micro-targeting came along, I, 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 it didn't threaten us. I just think it offered us new opportunities, yeah? So the idea of being able to zoom in even more into the granular detail of the customer beyond demographics, I think, was attractive. What Byron Sharp has done, almost single-handedly, is dragged us from this extreme back almost to the point of mass marketing, but to the place where targeting isn't a question of how, but a question of whether you would even bother in the first place. And that, for me, is dangerous because most marketers don't really want to target, and now they get a, a, a games license not to. So what's been happening is that Febreze case is a perfect example of moving across the board. You watch for this next year. This is a big move. And it starts a major movement away from the granular targeting and standard targeting across back to sophisticated mass marketing. So far, Byron's only working for very large companies. It will, again, trickle down. Skip that one. The point I'd like to make to you about targeting is targeting is strategy, okay? For me, at least, and I'm now old-fashioned. Segmentation is about understanding the market. It's got nothing to do with the company. If you're as smart as your competitor, you should have the same segmentation. Theoretically, there's no reason it'd be different. Targeting is what separates good companies from bad. And if you look at what strategy means, it's really very straightforward. Strategy means deciding what you're not going to do. Everyone's going to do some shit, right? Sun Tzu, a thousand years ago, defined strategy as there are roads which must not be followed, armies which must not be attacked, towns which must not be besieged, plot positions which must not be contested, commands of the sovereign which must not be obeyed. The art of war, the art of strategy, was about where we don't attack rather than where we do. And a thousand years later, the always scary Michael Porter, the essence of strategy is choosing what not to do. Everyone's going to do something. The segments that you don't target are the ones that define your strategy, at least in my world. But Byron is changing that, and this discussion is up for grabs. So, the challenge of targeting next year becomes immense. Because before we get to which segments am I going to go after and all that, you've got to have a proper philosophical discussion with yourself as a marketer and decide what approach to marketing do I truly believe in? Because there's at least three equally attractive options. You can follow Facebook into this very granular and rather exciting world. You can follow me as the mainstream guy now of segmentation, targeting, positioning. That works in my experience. Or go with Byron into the, into the world of sophisticated mass marketing. The point is, I still think targeting is strategy. But as we learned from P&G, the first choice is what kind of targeting before the second choice, which is which targets. And it's made it an, an enormous area of debate that I think you have to have. All right, moving on. Five. Getting down the list now. Coca-Cola changes brand architecture. Fuck me, this is big. This is big. It sort of started last year, okay? It sort of started last year, but um, it's really taken all this year internationally. So here it is, the new approach, right? The new approach. So what you see is obviously cans of Coke, but it's more than just a design. These are now officially uh, what we call branded house different identity, okay? It's all Coca-Cola. These are no longer sub-brands. They're just product variants, yeah? That's the point here, okay? So Coke's new approach is significantly different from what it's been doing for the last 40 or 50 years. Now, 
How to explain this? So this is the most important spectrum or architecture in the world of brand management, right? This is what was written as the brand relationship spectrum by David Arker and Eric Jochemista, but I call the brand architecture spectrum. It is a fundamentally simple but crucial tool for us. It's like the Rosetta Stone. Remember they discovered the Rosetta Stone, and on one side it had, I think it was ancient Hebrew, and on the other side they had Egyptian hieroglyphs. And they were able then for the first time to translate hieroglyphics into English via the Hebrew. We finally have a language for the last 10 years where everyone can talk the same language of brand portfolio. So the way this works is you're the consumer looking at a company. Now obviously all the money goes to the same place, but what does the consumer see if they see multiple brands? And there are four positions. There's either a branded house, sub-branding where there's a lower product brand, endorsement where the product is big and the corporate small, or house of brands, the corporate disappears completely. Obviously what's happening is the role of the corporate brand is diminishing, but also, less obviously, the need to be good at marketing down here is very, very, uh, very, very strong. And you can have different companies using different architecture positions, okay? <clears throat> For example, BMW is pretty much a branded house. Ford has sub-brands. Nestle endorses. Diageo doesn't appear in any of its products. Okay? Making sense. The key point here is you can change architectures. Fifteen years ago, Unilever famously didn't just change their logo, they changed their architecture. Moving from a house of brands where Unilever didn't appear to an endorsed approach where the Unilever badge appeared on all the products. You can, you can move position. The point here is Coke are moving position. When Coca-Cola does anything different, it has to be in our list of important things. So Coke Zero was a sub-brand. Coca-Cola Zero. They've now moved to a branded house, different identity. Everything's Coke with a product description of zero sugar at the top. And everything you'll now see will be a single branded house campaign with the product variants occasionally mentioned. But for the most part, you will just see corporate brand advertising. Maybe featuring different products, but ultimately all singing from the same hymn sheet. Now, question for you. Why would Coke change their architecture? Has anyone worked it out? And it is a tough question. Why would they change after so many years? Sir? So, the answer is going to be said. And so? And so they've got to do something. Because the way that it works at the moment, nobody's buying Coca Cola because it's too sugary. And it's just not the, the way the world works. So why will this fix that problem? Nearly, you're half there, it's a very good answer. It's not quite it, I don't think, but it's a good answer. You're almost there. They're fucked, they're totally fucked, right? <laughs> Which is the tenor of your conversation, right? More than 70% of their sales come from carbonated beverages. And they're a fine company with great marketers, but they're so fucked, right? They've done everything they can to stave off disaster. Next year will be a horrendous year for Coca-Cola, unfortunately, right? This is gonna save them money. It's not gonna do anything to their sales. As their sales begin to decline, they can operate off a single brand approach. Their biggest cost of good would probably be advertising. They've just shrunk the cost. This is the start of the end, and I think Coke know it. This is how they're gonna gradually manage that decline. Uh, the big point here is lots of brands are doing this, not just Unilever and Coke. P&G has moved to endorsement. KPMG is getting rid of all of its little sub-brands. And if you look at Apple's brand architecture over the last two years, there aren't any iPads or iPhones anymore. It's just TV, right? Things are changing. They're all moving down the continuum. This is a massive thing. So, I think we have to have it on our list. Approaching the end. Facebook fucks up its numbers. <clears throat> so, what errors did they make? Five major errors were made this year, as you probably noticed. The big one was, for I think it was 18 months, miscalculating the average duration view of digital video on Facebook by 60 to 80%, which means 80%, right? <laughs> Four of these errors were in their favor, and one was against. Now, that's a fucking statistical uh, uh, amazingness, right? To have four of the five make your shit look better is not impossible, but probability-wise, it's intriguing. <laughs> and what Facebook said is, it will not affect the prices paid, yeah? Because we don't charge based on any of the metrics we got wrong. I think that's the worst thing they did. Clearly, that's true. But equally clearly, 
this data was bound to have moved some of the decisions towards Facebook video over other options. But the key point is right at the end is what Facebook said. Yes, we've got some of these metrics wrong, but of the, all the 220, the rest are still correct. 220 metrics is too many. I understand why they can have more than TV or print, but 220 smacks of measuring too much, which is why they keep getting it wrong. But what's going to happen with Facebook doing this? And part of a bigger theme, and I believe why we need it in our list, is I think you will see next year questioning of all data. Already people are starting to say you can't really trust Barb data because it comes from a panel, not 100% of the market. Yeah? So we're questioning samples and panels. Um, and I believe there's no data point that people will not question anymore. I'll give you one quick example. I just keep posting on LinkedIn random pieces of data just to annoy people, right? And then what people post back is hallucinogenically stupid, right? <laughs> no, no, no I've, follow me on LinkedIn purely for the fucking idiot comments that I get, right? So this is Australian TV spent over the last 10 years. The green is H1, the red is H2, all right? So I, forgive me, I may have got this wrong. I think that's approximately a straight line, okay? Approximately, yeah? Silly me, right? The minute I posted this showing the amount being spent in Australia on TV each year, more on say, I think what the chart shows primarily is marketing bias towards TV. What? Or are these adjusted for inflation? I hope so, otherwise 2016 should be pulling in 4.5 billion, so it's a massive decline, right? Or I'm assuming the chart only takes into account traditional spot revenue. Given the proliferation of content integration in the programs, imagine what the real figure might be. The point is, no one fucking looks at a straight line anymore and goes, that's a straight line, right? They go, oh, that's not fucking right. Sample's wrong, inflation's wrong, it should be higher, it should be lower. We are going into a crazy place when it comes to empiricism over the next few years. At number three, Kevin Roberts goes totally fucking mental and co commits career suicide. We have to have it in there. It is a legendary moment in the history of marketing. Ready? So, Kevin Roberts, inarguably one of the most famous marketers of all time, does an interview uh, with Lara O'Reilly, and I don't know what's going on, but he completely destroys a 30-year career. I'll give you three of the clips, all right? Ready? So, we're trying to impose our antiquated shit on them. This is him imposing his antiquated shit on women. That's the them, right? And they are going, actually, guys, you're missing the point. You don't understand. I'm way happier than you. Their ambition is not a vertical ambition. This is women's ambition, right? It's not a vertical, see? Women have a different kind of ambition, like a, a downwards ambition, you know what I mean? <laughs> not vertical, like a downwards, a horizontal ambition is what they have, see? We are not judging ourselves by those standards that you idiotic dinosaur like men judge yourself by. I don't think the lack of women in leadership roles is a problem. I'm just not worried about it because they're very happy, they're very successful, and they're doing great work. So I want to see Lara O'Reilly's face when he's trotting this shit out, right? Then he says he doesn't spend any time on supposed gender issues in his agencies, saying the issue is way worse in sectors like financial services. And then finally he finishes with, um, I think she's got real problems, right? The she in question is Cindy Gallup, right? That's called him out already. I think she's got real problems of her own making. I think she's making up a lot of stuff to create a profile and take applause and to get on a soapbox. So I think Cindy Gallup deserves enormous credit for the way she's approached all this. I hate political correctness, as you may have guessed, right? And I always find men talking about uh, women, and, and particularly the, the prioritization of women in the office is rather fucking depressing and a little bit fucking pathetic, right? Because it seems like they're catering. But in this case, I really think what Cindy Gallup did and what these comments were was so unpalatable that she deserves enormous credit. And I saw a talk and the quote that got me was, advertising is dominated by white guys talking to white guys. And I thought, that's absolutely right. And the next day I saw the talk, I went and put, I taught brand management on a Saturday, and I put this slide up. And um, I never thought about it, is my point, right? So this is, these are eight or nine of my slides defining, this is day one of my brand management course, definitions of brand equity, right? And um, I, I didn't realize, I'd been to Cindy's talk the day before, and then I put these up. And it was only when a female student pointed out that I'd just given her basically 15 old white straight men's opinion that A, I realized, and B, I realized something more important, which probably explains Kevin's nonsense as well. I don't think we see what we're doing a lot of the time. I think it genuinely isn't clear to us. So I, I do think we have to put this in the list, not just because you know, he's apologized since, but I think it proves that we have to stay aware of these things, yeah? Particularly those of us in the in, in the majority. Number two, 
The ANA report, fuck me, that's got to be right up the top in my opinion. You can disagree, right? So, let's, a couple of moments here. John Mandel is a very <laughs> heroic guy. So, John uh, used to run one of the big media agencies in the States. He's at the conference in Miami for the ANA. They're talking about transparency, and everyone's having a wonderful, friendly time, saying how awesome the industry is. And John Mandel gets up and takes a massive shit on the stage, right? <laughs> and what he basically says is, this is all nonsense. His exact words are, the issue, this is the idea of taking sur commissions and money behind dark corners. The issue is cultural. Media agencies are hiding things in barter. They're hiding things in programmatic. They have all kinds of ways to hide things from clients. They are not transparent about their actions. They recommend or implement media that is off strategy or off target if it works for their financial gain. Look, it's one thing to steal $10 million from a client. But it's another thing if you kill the brand in the process because you give it bad media. This is a verbatim quote from a man that ran one of the biggest media agencies in the world who only stepped down 18 months ago, right? This is the scariest shit you could possibly imagine, right? Closer to home, Deb Morrison from ISBA. Now, this is a very independent, very, uh, I'd say, fair uh, executive. Our market has known about transparency issues for a long time. Marketers have traded off that. They've done deals with the agencies. They know what's going on, but the whole thing has been exasperated by the growth in digital spend. I don't believe that the media agencies have got the best interest of their clients at heart anymore. I'm going to read that to you again, okay? This is the head of ISBA, okay? I don't believe that the media agencies have got the best interests of their clients at heart anymore. That's a stunning statement from someone who's respected and independent, yeah? So, what ended up happening was the ANA report was published based upon the American media buying practices. Widespread, uh, widespread fraud was discovered uh, in terms of what's illegal in America, which is overcharging or doing rebates. You can't do that in America. It's not illegal here, but it's illegal in America. Widespread practices were discovered. What, it's worth reading the report. You can download it for free. You'll discover two things. First of all, there were many examples discovered of media agencies doing suboptimal things with client money. But second, the clients come across as total morons. No idea what's going on. Not even really understanding the game that's being played. And what's worse is the response from the major media groups to the report. The ANA report and the objectivity of its authors need to be examined carefully. By refusing a dialogue with us and choosing a sensational approach, it seems clear the ANA is not trying to find a solution. Our outside legal counsel has asked the ANA to provide specifics. No one has done anything as a result on what should have been one of the most damning reports in the history of advertising. So the ANA publication, the hoo-ha that surrounded it, and the general rumors that are still reverberating around the industry has to be top of our list. And finally, let's finish in style, the digital duopoly. Now, this isn't a single story. This is the creeping dread of what is about to befall us in the industry. Now, let me make it clear. Both Google and Facebook are run by delightful, well-meaning, extremely good marketers. There's no evil there. It's not, there's not someone with a joystick and a cigar trying to fuck up the world. Okay, Let's make that clear. But that doesn't mean that what's happening is a good thing or unprecedentedly scary as we go through the next few years. So I only need three slides to explain why I think the digital duopoly, get used to that phrase, is going to be the big story of this year and the next few years as well. Just three slides. Slide number one. The UK is relatively unusual in that more than 50% of advertising dollars already is spent on digital communications. Okay? Estimates vary, and it might be 48%. But we are, because of the BBC, significantly ahead of even America in terms of the proportion of share of pie which now goes on digital, okay? It's, from, by most people's estimate, it's now more than 50%, whatever you want to call it, digital display, internet advertising search, it is now more than half the pie, okay? Stat number one. Stat number two. Of that digital pie, which is more than half, 28% of it this year went to Facebook, and 32% of it went to Google. They have more than half of the half which soon will be 60 or 70%. Yeah? So already this duopoly, we've never had that before, right? Not when it's that big a share of pie. And finally, 
of new business. That's of existing digital business. A lot of it is incumbent legacy money, okay? This is an estimate from America, but there's no reason this wouldn't be applicable to the UK. Of new incremental digital spend. So this is new money being dedicated to digital this year. 85% of it went to Google and Facebook. So what does that mean? It means that we are seeing an unprecedented level of domination for just two companies in the overall advertising spend of the UK. And what it also means, by the way, and my apologies, this is a photograph of a chart presented last week in America. It means that if you look at American data, the overall US ad, uh, advertising digital ad market's growing 20%, Google's growing 23%, Facebook's growing 68%, all other digital advertising companies are in decline. As Jason Kint noted yesterday, it does seem relevant to note that when you back out Facebook and Google, the digital ad industry actually shrunk in the first half of this year. They're going backwards faster and faster. And so, the big story for me of 2016 is the rise of the digital duopoly and the apparent lack of any competitive threat. The biggest advertising spend channel here and elsewhere soon will be digital marketing comps. It's also the fastest growing. If it keeps growing at 20%, it won't be 50% of the pie for long, it'll be 75%. It will be dominated by the two least regulated companies that we have with their wall gardens. It will be dominated by two giant foreign companies. And it will be dominated, and I don't think advertising agencies have really thought this through yet. You know, I work for news industries where we've worked it out, right? It'll be dominated by companies that do not need agencies to succeed. If you imagine Facebook and Google in the year 2025 are working through agencies, you, you're not getting it at all, right? Agencies are gone. <laughs> in agencies, you deal direct to get all of the best deals. And you're dealing with two companies that are fundamentally made up of good people who seem completely unaware of their power. This fake news thing, it, it, it's the first of many situations where enormous societal power has been given to companies that were not ready to take it. So, here's our 10, and then we'll throw it up. You ready? At 10, Brexit. At 9, Unilever changes its budgeting. At 8, Marriott merges. At 7, McDonald's gets a new ad agency, but doesn't fucking pay him any money. 6, P&G changes its targeting approach to mass marketing. 5, Coke's brand architecture changes. 4, Facebook fucks up its numbers. 3, Kevin Roberts quits career suicide. Two, the ANA report comes out and no one does anything about it. And one, the digital duopoly emerges. So, I'm going to put the list back up in a second. So, we leave it on the screen. Just five minutes, please, with your uh, new friend, lover, slash uh, enemy. I'd like you to work out two things. What have I missed from my list? Is there another story that should be there? We'll take, let's say, five or six suggestions. Okay, so what's missing? And second, what's wrong with the order... Is something too high or too low? And we'll jiggle around with it so we can write the article for next week. Okay? Five minutes, off we go. So, what's the first one that we've missed or I've missed that we should have up there? Madam. Say again. Oh, there, yeah, that's a good one. Yeah, but so you think it's big enough to justify because the, the, big, the big accounting firms are getting into it. Yeah, do you get that, Russ? I, I did miss that. Yeah. Camera, what are they called? Cameramas. And PwC was it? Who bought them? Accenture. Same thing. Uh, Accenture bought <laughs> Accenture bought Cameraman, which is which means that Accenture's moving into the media space. Big surprise! All the big four are looking at media now because of the issues with media. That's a good one. Uh, we might have that one, sir. Okay, I'm going to talk about the fact that you have said that discounting and price promotions are the heroin of marketing. Quote yes. unquote yourself, yes. right? And that in this year, 50% of items purchased in the UK. We're on discount. That's system. very good. That's right. I mean, there isn't a single news moment, right? There isn't a single news moment. Can you think of an example where we could... Is there a brand that's done it that's newsworthy? Because you're absolutely right. It's a great point. But is there one story we could pick up on? Oh, gosh. You put so, me under the spot. What was that? Which one? Trump. I, look, I don't think Trump's got much to do with marketing. I think Trump's got a lot to do with Trump. You know what I mean? It's a cliche. I mean, I'm with you. But Trump's become a, a, a cliche, so I deliberately avoided him. And like Brexit, I think we get a bit into the popular culture. I'll hold the thought on that. It's a great point if we can find an example. I love, I love the thought. So. There's a film on your Facebook button. Yes, they fucked up the numbers. 
but you've also got Mark Zuckerberg issuing a statement saying, we are not a media agent, media company, yeah. or a tech company. Um, there's no way that this will approach to serve influence and invisible decisions. But hey, all you're advertising, that will Massively be influential. Yeah, I like that. that. And you can see Facebook are pivoting now, to be fair to them, right? They just don't know what they're doing. All right, that might be one we'd pick up on. Sir at the back of the white T-shirt. Uh, you leave this acquisition Yeah, that's a good one. But I think they're going to... Is there something... What's the angle there? I mean, they've done it before with Ben and Jerry. What's the difference here? Yeah, yeah, that's nice. I mean, I think you leave are jolly good at that. I like the... It's a good one, whether it's newsworthy enough. Hey, uh, good looking fellow at the back. Um... <laughs> Ad blocking. Yeah, I, I, we looked at, I looked at that hard. It's, uh, d give me, what's the moment of ad blocking? See, I need a newsworthy thing, right? Who's the, who's the villain of the piece here? Or what's the story that we talk about? Because it is a theme, right? But is there a moment of ad blocking where it just went crazy this year? Just... Well, it grew by like 94% this year. And um, I just think it says a lot about, you speak about the big two and the duopoly. But actually, people don't want to see the content that we're serving uh, through them and actively going out to block it. And subscription modeling is growing as well because people would rather have ad-free content than yeah. be served ads. You make a good point. You know what the news point is? It's that stupid um, group they put together to try and like, make ads more pleasant for people. Mm. You know what they call like, the coalition of the fucking hopeless, whatever it was? <laughs> There's that stupidity going on. Yeah, all right, that, that might make it in there. Governor. Yeah, I mean, they're going to fuck it up, obviously, right? But what, we can write that one up for 2070. It is a big one, but I think it's, we'll see how that plays. It's a nice one. It's Governor. ESPN's uh, subscriber base is going down. That's a good one. But I don't know what they are. I mean, we know that audiences are going down for sporting events and ESPN. But there's also a, lot, a large sprinkling of bullshit in there as well, right? I'm, but we could have a little look at that. All right. General decline in sports audiences. You, you, yeah, you're making me interested. Let's do one more good one, and then I think we've got a nice shortlist that we'll have to consider for next weekend. One more that we've missed. Going, going. What, madam, over there. Yeah. It's really relevant to all this kind of the way consumer interaction is changing. So there are five nights ago that was paid out of the card thing on Twitter, but it's turning into a basically natural rank of the class. No, that's good. But that's 17. That's very good. That's 17. The one that I thought you were going to go after is the Facebook versus YouTube situation is, is tasty for 17 too. Right? They've never, they don't even mention each other. Have you noticed? It's like, no, no, don't talk about him, right? At some point, these two big fucking dinosaurs are going to turn around and just start tearing shit out of each other, right? But not until they finish with everyone else first. But that's a great one. For, I like that one for next year. All right, so that's a good shortlist that we'll add. Russell's writing them down. Is there anything that should be higher or lower? Give me two or three and I'll let you drink wine. Where have we gone wrong? Governor. Yeah, that's not bad. That's not bad. That's not bad. Or killing them both. All right. The Roberts thing's kind of important, right? Because I do think, oh, it's politically correct. I don't want to be a wanker about it. But I think we should remind ourselves of that. Not because we want to give Kevin shit, but it's still going on. The women in the room, you earn 25% less than the men. You know, if I was a woman, I'd be fucking angry about that. I'm a man, so I think it's probably spot on. But if I was a woman... <laughs> I would be super, I would be super unhappy. So it's still going on, right? We haven't fixed the problem by firing Kevin Roberts. The, the problem is much deeper, but you make a fair point. Madam. Ah, that's good. That's good. You should be an editor. That's way better than the advice he gives me. <laughs> Sir, what have you got for me? That's it. And don't understand and share their views. And that's Trump, that's Brexit, that's Italy, that's uh, the rise of the right wing. And so I just think that's much bigger. The, the population is behaving in surprising and unexpected ways to the people who rule the world. But it's not really surprising, it's just that they've got to take their heads out of their asses. Yeah. That's very good. Yeah, all right, I'm buying that. And then we get Trump in as well. Last one. Can we change one more thing? Madam in the back, what should we change?
Oh, you could do that. You could do that. But there's some different ones there too, I think. Is there anything that we should push higher that we haven't pushed high enough? Everyone's pushing things down. Madam? Ooh. Ooh. Yeah, that's good stuff. Yeah, that's good stuff. That's dirty, aggressive stuff from you, that is. <laughs> what, Coke is the new Nokia? Yes. Hmm. That's a good place to hide. Last one, Governor. Yeah, I, I think that P&G is targeting. You're really saying it's the end of your beloved STP. The whole utility of marketing, as you call it, yes. is dying, and you're only putting it at number six. No, no, I'm with you, but I have to have a fight with Byron Sharp then, and I don't want to do that until 2018. <laughs> no, it's a good point. It's a good point. All right, I'll keep that up there. I think that one may be deserving of more, and I think we'll also give Coke a go as well. All right, final point for me, and I, I, will, uh, I, will, I will leave you. So, we've agreed with the Marketing Academy, purely in, non in promotional form, we will give one free place on the mini MBA in marketing that we run in January or maybe early February to someone who wins some kind of lottery that I don't understand. So, we are going to offer a place, I just don't know how whoever it is here gets it, right? So we run a, I run a, a 12-week digital mini MBA in marketing. Uh, we've just finished the first class with an MPS of plus 80, which we're very pleased with, 400 students plus 80. So some lucky punter here, if you do something that I understand, will get to come on the course in February, okay? So happy Christmas, everyone. Glass of wine shortly. And to wrap up, I will now hand it over to Sarah, who will say a few words in closing. Sarah.